Except I gotta turn down the lights. So um, we were talking about aromaticity last time. And um, I just wanna show you a few things that are, I'm not sure how worth knowing they are, but they are maybe sort of interesting. So, come on, no, you're not gonna let me. Um, Oh, there's mysterious clanging in the pipes. Oh, well. Um, so they've found that you can make aromatic systems sort of up to a certain size, but that beyond that size, uh, they stop really being planar and stop being aromatic. So one of the largest aromatic cycles you can make is called 18 aniline and this is just a hydrocarbon and you kind of have to be careful while you're drawing it so that you end up at the right spot but it's fully conjugated and got to have the right stereochemistry of the bonds it's called 18 aniline and you is you know for a ring and it is, in fact, aromatic. But if you get beyond like 22 uh, electrons, then uh, you're really pushing it and there's really no benefit to aromaticity anymore. Um, another interesting thing is, let's see, I'm gonna try the internet again, um, is something called, and I don't wanna spend hardly any time on this, but it's called Mobius aromaticity. I remember learning about this just briefly in my um, grad school. Uh, just a second, Dakota. I'm mid thought, and then I will come back to you. In my in my grad school physical organic class, and I remember not understanding it and thinking it was weird. But so I'm going to show it to you, and together we will not understand it and think it's weird. Go ahead. So does that mean that, for example, there's not much difference in stability between, say, a 36 carbon conjugated ring? Yeah, so what that would mean is if you had, um, if you were to compare, say, uh, 24 or 26 aniline, I'm not sure what the numbers would be, but uh, I guess compare 26 aniline to its um, linear counterpart, and the difference in stability wouldn't be that much, presumably. There are other, remember NMR is a diagnostic tool for um, detecting aromaticity, and so if something is not less aromatic, you would expect to see chemical shifts more consistent with being on, an al being on a vinyl carbon than being aromatic, right? And uh, the other thing could be reactivity. Maybe it starts to react as though it were an alkene instead of, um, aromatic as then able to exactly as though able to uh, undergo an ad addition so um, the rules we have for aromaticity apply for uh, cyclic systems uh, that have uh, overlapping uh, p orbitals uh, where the phase doesn't change as you stay on the same side of the molecule and at some point somebody asked the question what if we took that strip of p orbitals and we forced it to have one twist in it okay so instead of going around in a consistent array with even overlap you start to twist the chain and it's sort of difficult to see but by the time you get around the circle you've got sort of out of phase overlap and uh, the theory suggested that if you did that then the rules would switch and 4n plus 2 electrons would no longer give you uh, special stabilization, but 4n electrons would, okay? Now, there's some theoretical, you can look at the, at the uh, Wikipedia article. They explain, based on sort of Huckel MO theory, why it would be that way. But, of course, the real test was, can you even make something like this? Um, so here is trans C9 H9 cation, and it's difficult to see how there's a Mobius strip there. So I want to show you a, a more, uh, the, the, the first demonstration of a uh, system experimentally in 2003. And this compound that was isolated was stable enough to 
uh, sit in a jar and stare at you in crystalline form. It was sort of bright orange and uh, and it had properties consistent with aromaticity, though it had the wrong number of electrons. So they started with this really strange um, multi-cyclic system. This is like uh, linking two anthracene molecules together. And then they did a series of photochemical cycloadditions, which uh, it isn't important that you understand that, but basically by the time they opened the ring up and got to compound six, um, they had several stereoisomers, some of which they were able to isolate, and the stereochemistry of the double bonds made it so that the molecule was Mobius aromatic. Um, and if you count the electrons, let's see, we've got in the conjugated system two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So that's not 4n plus 2, that's 4n. So we would have predicted that's anti aromatic. Nevertheless, the crystallographic evidence suggests that uh, it's aromatic. And we'll go to the article actually in Nature. This was 2003. So I graduated from here in 2003, so now I understand. I didn't pay any attention to the literature back then, uh, which shame on me, but um, uh, I, I now know why my physical organic chemistry uh, professor talked about it, because it was new um, in ancient history. Yes, yes, whatever, except all cookies continue spying on me. <laughs> um, so, here is the crystal structure. They have one isomer on the right that does that is um, not twisted, and then the other isomer on the left that is twisted, the one that's C2, Mobius, and you sort of have to, I wonder if I can copy this, copy, and we can sort of draw on it to see how it actually is Mobius aromatic. Um, and this isn't in your text, we're just doing it because it's fun. So if you hate meaningless digressions, then um, I apologize. Um, there's some chemistry which is just basically g whizology. And uh, Unfortunately, some of physical organic chemistry is that way. Um, the greatest physical organic chemists have been the ones that have been able to take something that was gee whiz cool and then apply it to something that's important in the real world. Um, all right, so let's just put a p orbital on each of these atoms and let's assume sort of above and below there. We've still got above and below here not really seeing a twist yet. This, uh, if we were to look at it from the side like they did in the article, I think the double bond in the front, uh, they don't say, really? Come on. I'm not sure whether the double bond in the front is cis or trans, that might affect our answer, oh well. Um, above and below, above and below, above and below. Uh, then here's the other one. And then there's kind of a twist here because you're going up on the outside, the backside of that anthracene ring. So from our perspective here, there would be inside the ring and outside the ring. So let's see if we can follow that around with phases and I'm gonna just try not to... Oh, right, and then there's a couple here in the benzene ring. All right, is that clear as mud? Uh... And that's the Mobius point, right? So in order for 
this atom to sort of stay conjugated with this atom on the benzene ring, you kind of have to have pink phase being pointed towards us in order for it to be conjugated here. You kind of have to have pink phase towards us in order for that to be conjugated with the benzene ring. I'm struggling to see the bonds here. you'd need the pink face to be down and then, yep, oh, here's the connection. This is so hard. Um, this face to be down, pink down, and then we've got a mismatch. Anyway, hard to follow around and I'm not sure I really understand and follow the reasoning, but uh, it's kind of weird and cool that you can get aromatic properties out of a system that um, shouldn't have it uh, by introducing a twist. Um, one of the reasons they suggested that this had aromatic properties is that um, it was a bond length argument, though frankly in an aromatic system you wouldn't expect to see alternation you would expect to see those bond lengths all be the same. So anyway, it's a somewhat controversial issue and because it's G whizology, we won't spend any more time on it, but I thought it was kind of cool. Um, and this just shows you what would make a nature paper back in 2003. Um, all right, so um, your book shows you uh, something about anti-aromaticity. The only thing I want to talk about briefly about that, you should look and, and make sure you understand uh, the reasoning behind or, or how they get to the answer that anti-aromaticity is probably more destabilizing than aromaticity. Um, it's destabilizing enough that, for example, cyclobutadiene will actually distort its structure to uh, be to be a little less conjugated, such that um, you break the degeneracy of the aromatic orbitals. One goes down, the other goes up, and you end up having no unpaired electrons anymore. Um, so uh, cyclobutadiene, can, which is still nonetheless very reactive, uh, undergoes this sort of equilibration, stretch, 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 kind of a Laffy Taffy stretch or something like that. The barrier is about five to 10 kilocalories per mole. You may hear this called and only people trying to impress you uh, with their knowledge of jargon will use this. Jargon, is that like some alien guy, jargon, whatever, we'll call this a pseudo Jan Teller effect. So you really have to care because first you have to know what the heck a Jan Teller effect is and then you have to know why this is not a real Jan Teller effect, <laughs> but a pseudo Jan Teller effect. So, but you'll hear people mention that. All right, enough boring stuff. Um, we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about what um, the impact of heteroatoms on conformations. Uh, so far, we've mostly dealt with uh, conformations of things that are hydrocarbons. Um, so I want to start with cyclohexane rings. And we're going to compare two different situations. So I'm going to draw just a cyclohexane ring with a methyl group axial. And the A value for that is one, about 1 1.8 kilocalories per mole. And that is due to, of course, these, uh, there are unfavorable gauche interactions as with the ring as well as the 1,3 uh, diaxial interactions with those axial protons. Now, if we replace two of those atoms in the ring with oxygens, Ah, uh, oh well. Uh, and then measure the same A value for having the methyl group axial. The A value actually skyrockets. 
I don't know if you remember, uh, but in a regular cyclohexane ring, uh, even isopropyl doesn't have an A value that high. That's approaching T butyl A value in the terms of equilibrium constant. And remember that each factor, each uh, difference of 1.36 kilocalories per mole at 298 Kelvin is a factor of 10 in equilibrium constant. So you could argue that the conformation where methyl is axial here uh, is way less stable, perhaps 100 times less stable than the conformation where the methyl group is axial in cyclohexane. So what are we, potential explanations? If you had to rationalize that, what would you say? If it's not sterics, it's electronics. <laughs> okay. All right. Can we be slightly more specific? Yeah, give it a try. Oxidants donate extra electron density into the alpha group, which is already electron rich. Okay. Oxygens. Are you thinking about lone pairs and maybe hyperconjugation? Yeah, I was thinking of the lone pairs repelling the methyl electrons. Okay. Um, okay, that's interesting. The lone pairs repelling the methyl group. Um, what do you know about oxygen or any other thoughts? Yeah, Michael. Um, All right. So rationalize that. Is that is that a fact? It is a fact, actually. Carbon oxygen sigma bonds. So we can use that fact. Carbon oxygen sigma bonds are shorter. Um, let's just pause. Why are carbon oxygen sigma bonds shorter? You know the difference between the two is, we're stretching here, electronegativity, fine, great, but I'm gonna be the two-year-old and say, what has that got to do with anything? There's an MO explanation and a valence bond theory explanation. Yeah, go ahead, Austin. Uh huh. So when you're mixing orbitals, um, I guess you've got your difference in energy there, so it looks more like the oxygens, which are closer and therefore shorter. Okay, right. So because oxygen's lower in energy, the bonding orbital formed from oxygen will also be lower in energy. Lower in energy is a stronger bond. Stronger bonds are shorter. Um, the valence bond theory explanation, I think, is that the more electronegative one partner in the bond is, the more favorable the non-bonded resonance structure is where you just have a full charge on one atom interacting with a full charge on the other atom. Um, in any case, that's based on principles we know. So if carbon-oxygen bonds are shorter than carbon-carbon bonds, how does that explain our observation here. Okay, so the fact that this is shorter is going to move this methyl group over a little bit relative to where it would be in the cyclohexane. So we're going to have worse 1 3 diaxial interactions. Okay. Um, Sounds good. Go ahead, Jared. Yeah. That's a that's a good question. Um, we talked about how if there's an energy gap between two orbitals that mix, the 
energy difference that you go down from the lowest energy orbital is not as great as it would have been if you had started with two even orbitals. Now, um, still, because oxygen's more negative, or I'm sorry, more lower in energy than carbon, even though this distance is smaller, the distance from sort of your average starting point can still be large enough to have it be a strong bond. Yeah. Um, all right, other questions? So what if we instead change, let's, let's draw an isomer where instead we put the axial methyl group here. When we do that, the A value equals 0 0.8. So that's a trend in the opposite direction. Why is that? Exactly. There's no one three. That's kind of a. That's that's only confusing until you realize it the first time, and then you're like, oh, why didn't I see that? Um, right. There's no hydrogens at those uh, one. Uh, there's no one three. Uh, di Dang it. Isabella, just say it again because I can't get it. Thank you. There's no the oxygens don't have axial protons on them, so there are. No 1, 3 diaxial interactions. Good. Okay. Um, a little bit of the same thing you can start to do. Uh, by the way, rings with two oxygens in them are called dioxanes. Um, this is a, I think, a 1, 3 dioxane. Uh, the kind of dioxane you often use as a solvent, I think, is 1,4-dioxane. If you instead put sulfurs there, it's called a dithiane. And, as and aside from being, like, probably pretty gross to smell, there are some sometimes some interesting things you can observe. Uh, uh, so um, T-butyl group uh, normally uh, in a cyclohexane has an A value of, like, 5. In this dithiane, however, the A value is uh, around 2.7. Okay, so, and I'm sorry I don't have the A value for uh, T-butyl and cyclohexane, but I think it's around 5. Uh, and these are units of kilocalories per mole. So, why isn't T-butyl as bad in the dithiane as it is in the cyclohexane? Longer bonds. Okay. What do you know about carbon and sulfur's electronegativity? Not that different, right? Electronegativity sort of falls off as you go down the periodic table. What do you know about sulfur's size relative to carbon? Should be bigger by some amount. The increased radius of sulfur plus the difference in energy between carbon and sulfur makes it so carbon-sulfur bonds are weaker than carbon-oxygen bonds. So weaker bonds are longer bonds which means that the 1, 3 diaxial interactions are not as bad. OK, um, so these are some ways in which you might rationalize some conformational differences uh, based on uh, what you know about bonding. Yeah. Oh, yes, it would still definitely prefer to be in the equatorial position. It's just not as bad as you would expect. All right. Um, and this kind of thing is important because, of course, most of the molecules we're interested in do have heteroatoms in them. A very important class of molecules. Uh, carbohydrates are like, in many cases, cyclohexane rings, but with an oxygen. And that can make some interesting uh, differences in terms of reactivity. 
So we're now going to talk about a hetero atom, uh, a f in, well, the impact of hetero atoms uh, in what your book calls donor acceptor interactions. And uh, we would just call this hyperconjugation. But there was some useful stuff that I never really saw formulated this way before, which I think is, is very helpful to organizing your thinking. We've already seen a donor acceptor interaction in stuff that we talked about earlier uh, in, in uh, confirmations. Uh, for example, with 1,2-difluoroethane, we talked about how having the fluoro groups gauche to each other is actually better because the uh, carbon hydrogen filled carbon hydrogen sigma in the back can donate electron density into the oops empty uh, carbon fluorine sigma star and that this is enough of a stabilizing effect. So in the back you've got the carbon hydrogen sigma. I'm not drawing that orbital, you can imagine it. And in the front we've got the carbon fluorine sigma star. Having those groups gauche to each other makes it so a CH bond can be donating electron density to the CF antibonding orbital. And one of the things we may not have talked about is why is it better for the carbon hydrogen sigma to donate than the carbon fluoride sigma? Any thoughts there? Yes, why? Right, right. Fluorine is more electronegative than carbon. That means all the bonding orbitals that come from fluorine are going to be lower in energy than those that come from atoms that are less electronegative than fluorine. So sigma CH is higher in energy than sigma CF and is therefore a better donor for hyperconjugation. And um, your book has sort of a list as to what good donors are for hyperconjugation. It puts lone pairs as being better than bonding orbitals. Duh, because lone pairs are higher in energy than bonding orbitals, right? We knew that. Uh, and then in terms of what lone pairs are better, well, I guess if you have a negatively charged carbon, that would be better than a nitrogen, which would be better than an oxygen uh, lone pair in a p orbital, which would be better than an oxygen lone pair in an sp2 orbital, which would be better than a lone pair on fluorine. That's just basically electronegativity, right? Again, explaining to you which lone pairs are higher in energy and which are lower in energy. The ones on carbon are higher in energy because carbon is less electronegative than fluorine. Um, similarly, and for, for similar reasons, iod, uh, lone pairs on iodide would be a better hyperconjugating donor than lone pairs on fluorine. I can't think of a lot of examples where that would be the case, so I'm just not going to write that down, but that's in your book. Uh, sigma CHs are better donors for hyperconjugation than nitrogen hydrogen bonds, which are better than oxygen hydrogen bonds. Uh, and then there are some other, uh, other trends that uh, we could rationalize based on similar arguments. In terms of what the good acceptors are, this is. Um, interesting and it may be new to you 
uh, carbon fluorine sigma stars are better acceptors than carbon oxygen sigma stars, which are better acceptors than carbon nitrogen sigma stars, which are better acceptors than carbon. Whoa there, Joshua, what have you done? Carbon carbon sigma stars. Sorry, got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, similarly, carbon iodide sigma stars are better than carbon bromine sigma stars, which are better than carbon chloride sigma stars, which are better than carbon fluoride sigma stars. Um, okay, so let's talk about this trend, why a carbon fluorine sigma star would be a better donor than a carbon oxygen sigma star. Because I thought we said that the carbon fluorine bond was more stable than the carbon oxygen bond. So what's going on there? All right. So we've um, we've perhaps you've been thinking, as I have, uh, based on our orbital mixing that. Um, when you mix two orbitals, the bonding orbital is, goes down, but the antibonding orbital goes up a little bit more than the bonding orbital goes down. And therefore, you could be uh, tempted to conclude that the more the bonding orbital goes down, the more the antibonding orbital goes up. Um, and that's a reasonable approximation when you're comparing two orbitals that, are, that start out uh, similar in energy. But if you take this carbon, sort of we're representing a carbon-carbon bond, here's the sigma, here's the sigma star. Um, if we take one of those carbons and replace it with fluorine, we're basically moving that fluorine down. Now because the fluorine already starts out much lower than carbon, even though there's this energy gap here that we've called delta or something, that looks like a weird note. Um, even though there's this energy gap that we've called delta, and even though we've said that the bigger that energy gap, the less stabilization you get here, fluorine already starts out pretty low. And so lowering it a little bit uh, still makes you lower in energy than the carbon-carbon sigma bond. Similarly, because of the energy gap, the antibonding orbital doesn't go up quite as much. Um, and that's the change. See, the carbon fluoride sigma, bond, uh, sigma star is lower in energy than the carbon-carbon sigma star because of the energy gap between carbon and fluoride, the bonding orbital doesn't go down by that much and the antibonding orbital doesn't go up by that much. And so the sigma star is not up where the carbon-carbon sigma star is. So you may have to correct uh, an item in your thinking. You may have thought before um, that bond strength uh, means a, a very low energy bond and a very high energy antibonding orbital. And once you put electronegativity in the mix, you have to be careful because of the arguments that we've just described. Um, all right. What else? So, um, questions about that? Maybe let's do some examples. Um, repeat the last part, Marier. Okay, right, so you may have thought of a strong bond as meaning a really low in energy bond and a bonding orbital and a really high in energy antibonding orbital, but, and that's true when you're mixing orbitals that are close together in energy, when you're mixing orbitals that are further apart in energy, um, 
and you put electronegativity into the mix, yes, your bonding orbital that's filled is going to be stable, but your antibonding orbital is not going to be that much higher than the carbon atom that you started with. So this is why the carbon uh, fluorine sigma star is lower in energy than the carbon carbon sigma star. Is that okay? All right. Um, so let's talk about preferred conformations. Uh, hydrogen peroxide is kind of a funny example. Based on sterics, you would maybe predict that um, you'd want those two oxygen-hydrogen bonds anti to each other. And probably if you've actually drawn hydrogen peroxide before, probably you drew it that way if you drew the oxygen-hydrogen bonds at all. Another feature that can be uh, potentially stabilizing in nonpolar solvents is that, that in this arrangement, the dipoles would tend to cancel. Um, however, there's another effect going on here, and it's a donor acceptor effect. So let's look at what type of conformation we would need for the hydrogen, let's say the hydrogen in the back, we're looking down that oxygen-oxygen bond, to donate into the oxygen-hydrogen sigma star in the front. All right, so we're going to be talking about the carbon, I'm sorry, the oxygen hydrogen sigma in the back donating into an oxygen hydrogen. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. We need to back, I just need to erase all of that and just scratch everything and then start over. Is that okay? Um, we said that you would expect based on sterics for the hydrogens, oxygen hydrogens to be anti if you were looking down the uh, oxygen oxygen bond. But you have these lone pairs on the oxygens that can donate into the oxygen hydrogen sigma star. All right. So I'm going to draw as though we're looking down that bond, I'm going to draw the oxygen hydrogen sigma star in the back. And we'll fill in the phases. I'm sorry about my confusion. Now let's talk about the hydrogen in the front. Um, do you remember when we learned about water and we modeled water as bent CH2? Do you remember that um, in addition to the sigma orbital and the pi orbital, we had a sigma out that was basically a lone pair on oxygen. And then we also had orthogonal to that sigma out and orthogonal to the oxygen hydrogen bonds, we had a p orbital that also had, uh, depending on the situation, also had two electrons. And we concluded that in water, oxygen has an S-rich lone pair and a P-rich lone pair. Which of those two is higher in energy? The one that's in the sigma out or the one that's in the P? In the P. S character is more electronegative, lower in energy. So ideally, we would like the P-rich lone pair on oxygen to overlap with the sigma star on the back carbon. So I've gone ahead and drawn a uh, P rich lone pair on oxygen. Now you tell me if we want to put the P orbital there, where has the S rich lone pair and the other hydrogen, where do they have to be? Look at the relationship over here. Let's 
Right. So, uh, but relative to the two. So, if the sigma out orbital with the sigma bonds and with the lone s rich lone pair are in the plane of the page, then the p orbital is orthogonal to it coming out at us and going back in. So if the p orbital here is up and down, where should I put the carbon hydrogen bond? Perpendicular, right? So actually, uh, in terms of electronics, if you want to have lone pair in the front, we would call this n to sigma star hyperconjugation. You'd want to have the dihedral angle be around 90 degrees, which is maybe different than you would have expected. Now it turns out reality is a hybrid between having the uh, protons anti to each other and having them uh, 90 degrees with respect to each other. What you end up with is sort of an 100 and, I'm sorry I screwed that up. Um, it was the proton in the back that was down. In reality, the proton in the front isn't quite 90 degrees. It's a little bit less. You still get some hyperconjugation, but you're able to overcome sterics a little bit. Um, so this is a case of using donor acceptor or hyperconjugation interactions to explain things that are unusual, things that you might not have expected. Go ahead. So the hydrogen peroxide molecule is not famous. It's not that's right. Hydrogen peroxide isn't planar now. Probably, you know, there's a barrier to rotation. We're describing the lowest energy conformation. Probably that thing's spinning around. But what we've described is the reason why that's the lowest energy conformation. Okay, I think I got lost somewhere. Okay. So we wanted the P orbital to donate into the sigma star's O In the back. Yep. Uh, so in the front is the P orbital. Yeah, it's, um, too many things. All right, so I'm going to, ah, sure, okay. Here is the P orbital in the front. And then in the back is the ah oxygen hydrogen sigma star and i've just drawn drawn part of it right. okay. that mm -hmm. alternatively if you were to draw this from the side Here is the P orbital on oxygen, and here is the oxygen hydrogen sigma star. Um, in, uh, in proteins, you have bonds that are sort of isoelectronic with oxygen oxygen bonds. These are called disulfide bonds, and it turns out that uh, because sulfur is less electronegative, Cis stands for an amino acid called cysteine. Because sulfur is not as electronegative as oxygen, the dipole effect doesn't matter quite as much. And so if we look down a car, a sulfur sulfur bond in a protein, we see what we would expect based on electronics. The carbon hydrogen bond in the front is orthogonal to the carbon hydrogen bond in the back, dihedral angle of 90. So that um, the p orbital, I guess, on the, on the sulfur in the back can overlap with the carbon sulfur sigma star in the front. So here's the carbon sulfur sigma star in the front. And here is the p orbital from sulfur in the back. Same, same sort of reasoning. So if you go look at crystal structures of proteins and you see, di and you look down dihedral, I'm sorry, disulfides, often the dihedral angle will be 90 degrees, which is again, different than you might expect based on sterics alone. So if it's not sterics, it's electronics. Uh, these kinds of hyperconjugation effects where um, the 
relative orientation of two different groups in the molecule matters, we call stereoelectronic effects because it's, an, it's, a, it's a case where stereochemistry and, uh, and uh, electronic effects uh, mix together. Um, the last thing we want to talk about, and I should have left more time for it, is what is called the anomeric effect. So let me just ask you what you've heard about that before. Heard the word before? Anomeric effect-ish? Yeah, go ahead. Anomeric means the carbon of two oxygen Right. We use the term anomeric carbon to refer to the acetal carbon. Uh, in carbohydrates. And the anomeric effect, it means um, that you would normally expect in such rings for the equatorial um, conformation or, and we'll call the stereochemistry of this OR group that is up, we'll call this beta, and we'll call this one the beta anomer. Uh, whereas this is the alpha anomer, um, and this carbon one is the anomeric carbon. Um, axial is in the alpha configuration. The anomeric effect is that the alpha anomer is more stable than you would expect. Maybe not necessarily more stable than the beta anomer, depending on the molecule, but it is more stable than you would predict based on A values. And the reason for this is N to uh, sigma star hyperconjugation that is more efficient in the alpha anomer. So I will just draw briefly for you on our molecule, um, the lone pair, the P-rich lone pair on oxygen in this carbohydrate. This is the one that has electrons in it. And then we're going to draw the empty sigma star uh, associated with this carbon-oxygen bond on the anomeric carbon. And if you do that, you can see that in the alpha anomer, you can have the lone pair on, the P-rich lone pair on the oxygen, we'll just call that N, because it's in a non-bonding type orbital, can align with the carbon oxygen sigma star to give you a stabilizing hyperconjugative mixing effect. And you should convince yourself that that's not possible in the beta um, anomer. Now, for many of these types of molecules, you can actually exchange between alpha and beta anomers. It's actually really easy the neighboring oxygen just has to kick off the group on carbon one as a leaving group, and you get uh, as an intermediate what is often called an oxocarbenium ion. And I realize probably that this OH need, OR needs to get protonated before it leaves. That's fine. We're just, uh, um, but then once you get the oxocarbenium ion, your nucleophile can come in from above the ring or below and then you'll get the alpha or the beta anomer. And so in many cases, this, uh, you can measure the equilibrium between alpha and beta anomers uh, directly. Um, so let me show you a few examples um, from the literature. I'm gonna draw a carbohydrate here. This is gonna be per acetyl glucose in its both alpha and beta forms. And because I know you're anxious to get out of here, I'm gonna copy and paste, but all of this is in your text. 
you can measure the equilibrium and these two are present in equilibrium at a one to five ratio, which is exactly backwards from what you would have expected based on sterics. And the reason is because of the anomeric effect or that's just a fancy way of saying N to sigma star hyperconjugation that's available to the alpha anomer but not to the beta. Go ahead. Do the acetyl groups influence this at all? Because I thought I remember learning that for plain glucose, beta is slightly more favored than alpha. Do the acetyl groups influence things? Almost certainly. Um, and I believe that just for plain glucose, it's more of a one to one ratio. I can't rationalize that off the top of my head, though. Go ahead. N stands for lone pair on oxygen. Maybe we should say lone pair to sigma star hyperconjugation. Maybe that's the whole N to sigma star. That's a, that's a holdover from when I took Paul Savage's class in 2000. No, it was, yes, it was 2000, fall 2000, and 20 year old knowledge. That's kind of. Yeah, yeah. But I'll try to be more specific. Lone pair. Sounds better. All right, so there's uh, a few other examples of that. That basically takes us through chapter two. So um, have a good weekend. Don't get COVID. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And my sign off at the end of my 352M lectures last time was stay safe, stay healthy, and stay organic. <laughs> and then we need some music to take us out or something like that. But all right. Thanks a lot. We'll see you guys next time.